Our next guest was one of the pioneers of America's race to space on October 14th, 1947. He became the first man to travel faster than the speed of sound, breaking the barrier in the experimental X-1 aircraft. He was hailed as a hero and soon became America's most respected test pilot and eventually a brigadier general in the Air Force. As Tom Wolfe explains in his book entitled The Right Stuff, he was the role model for every pilot in America. Now, to help illustrate what you will be seeing next, we have an animated simulation of General Yeager's arrival onto the set and his positioning in the chair next to my desk. If we can see that footage now, I think you get an idea of what's ahead. There, that would be me. This is a simulation, ladies and gentlemen. I've just introduced Chuck Yeager. There he is. And he, <laughs> fine. Uh, my thanks to the NBC News Department for that clip. And now please welcome I believe this is our first Brigadier General ever on this show, Chuck Yeager. Man, I, had, I had trouble keeping hair out of my eyes when I had animation, didn't it? Oh, yes. Uh, this is... Even this now, you broke the record and broke the speed of sound in 1947. And yeah. even today, this is a fascinating story. Uh, I know it's a long story, but briefly, how were you selected for the job? Well, I was a fighter pilot in World War II in Mustangs. I came back in 1945 from the war and was assigned to right field as a maintenance officer in the fighter test section. And I went through the test pilot school in 1946, and then I was selected for the X-1 program in the summer of 47 after the Bell test pilot said gotten into a hassle on bonus money and uh, and probably because of my maintenance background and and the air shows I used to put on. Now you mentioned money. What was the fee being paid to break the speed of sound here? Well, mostly the Bell test pilots had a fa two phases. First phase one, he took the airplane to point eight Mach number and 40,000 feet. That was worth about 50,000. And then to take it to 1.1 was worth about 150,000 bucks. But he wanted it paid over a five-year period. He couldn't blame the guy. Yeah. Now, what? Did, you didn't get the same kind of deal, though, did you? No. Uh, <laughs> no. I. We we were Air Force test pilots, and uh, we worked did it because we wanted to and liked to. And I think I was paid about 245 a month, which was okay. So. <laughs> uh, now this is a. Uh, it, it's hard to imagine because it's it's old hat now. What describe the aircraft? Was it just well, a, a rocket with wings? Yeah, the Bell X-1 you saw. Incidentally, what you saw on the film is the only time that the X-1 made a ground takeoff. All the other times it was dropped from a B-29 mothership, and the reason was we only had two and a half minutes of power with the rocket engine mm -hmm. under full power. Yeah. So they took us up to around 12,000 feet, and you got on a ladder and came into the X-1 and got hooked up, and they locked the door on, and then they took you up to 25,000 feet and then dove the B-29 up above 240 indicated and dropped you out. Then you ignited your rockets and and went on out to the Mach numbers that you were aiming for that day. Mach, of course, being, being the sound Mach barrier. Mach 1 is the speed of sound. Named for whom? A Dr. Mach, an Austrian. What are you trying to do, test me? Uh, <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Yeah. Mach was an Austrian uh, who discovered that the speed of sound changes with altitude. Mm -hmm. Here at sea level, is around 760 miles an hour. At 36,000 feet, it's around 660. Now, you were, you were a kid at the time, 24 years old. So, well, it's a matter of opinion. So. Uh, well, uh, chronologically speaking, now what... Uh, it was a real mysterious barrier, wasn't it? We had never had an airplane into the region of the speed of sound, and, and where I, as a fighter pilot in World War II fighting Germans, anytime you got in a dogfight, say at 36 or 38,000 feet, you'd end up in a dive after a guy, and you would get our Mustangs up to about 80% of the speed of sound, the shock waves would form on them, and you run into buffeting and lose control of your airplane. And the X-1 was really designed in 1943 and built in 44 to find out what was causing all of this. Uh -huh. And... We had never had an airplane in the region of the speed of sound, but the X-1 was built strong enough and had rocket thrust. And the secret behind the X-1 was that it, it was designed with a flying tail. And it was classified almost for a year after we did it. And the reason was we didn't know, want anyone to know how we'd gotten the airplane up above Mach 1. Uh -huh. And it, to tell you, Dave, how it really pays off, during the Korean War, we were shooting down about 12 megs for every F-86 we lost. And later on, 
a guy defected with a MiG-15, and I went over and tested the airplane, and it had a fixed horizontal stabilizer, whereas the F-86 had a flying, the, the flying tail. tail. We had found that out with the X-1. Yeah. That pays off. I don't know what the flying tail is, but it's, well, a, it's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quite a tail, incidentally. Yeah. So. Uh, the, I, well, we, do you want to tell them what the, that would probably take blueprints and all sorts of things to explain a flying tail? No, it? the old airplanes had a fixed horizontal stabilizer with an elevator That's on it. That's the wing in the back, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah okay. the tail in the back. <laughs> tail in the back. <laughs> and had an elevator on it. Well, with the X-1, we changed the angle of incidence yeah. of the whole tail plane. I see. That's a flying tail. So that was part of the reason you were successful. Yeah. Now, some folks ahead of you were not quite so successful, and uh, we'll continue talking with Brigadier General Chuck Yeager about that right now. Uh, Brigadier General Chuck Yeager is here, the man who broke the speed of sound. The others attempted before you, and uh, there were not uh, some bad results, weren't there? Well, basically, uh, David, uh, the British and the DH-108 that the Havilland Swallow were doing some work in the region of about 90% of the speed of sound, and they uh, busted up a couple airplanes, lost a couple coming pilots apart. coming yeah. apart. Yeah, because they did all of their work in the vertical dives because they didn't have the thrust that we had yeah. in the X-1. Most of the work that I did in the X-1 was in a slight climb somewhere around 40, 45,000 feet. But. Is there, uh, the story true about you breaking the sound barrier with broken ribs? Yeah. Now, explain that, and, and why would they let that take place? Uh, well, basically, when we were at Miroc Air Base back in 1947, we were pretty well on our own, just myself, Bob Hoover, and Jack Ridley, a team that was flying the X-1, of course, the B-29 crew, too. And on a Sunday night, I took my wife out to Poncho's, which was a local a water bar, right? watering yeah. hole near Miroc Air Base, and we were boozing it up. And <laughs> so we went riding on horses later that night, and I was out racing with my wife, and somebody closed the gate that we'd come out of. <laughs> and, and I saw it, laid my horse over, and it didn't respond like airplanes do. Yeah. And uh, so I hit the fence and flipped and broke a couple, couple ribs. And then on Tuesday, I was to fly the X-1. But it really was no problem. Once I got in the X-1, they got the door locked on the side. Then you're OK. But mm -hmm. uh, You had to use a broom handle or something to well, wedge yourself in? Or? the door was hard to close, and my ribs were busted on the right. And old Jack Ridley gave me a broom handle about that long to give me a mechanical advantage, and I could do it with my left yeah. arm. But that's the way it goes. So you, you test pilots lead a pretty rigorous training program <laughs> when you're for a big... Uh, now, sure. when, when you finally did yeah. it, was there a sensation that you perceived different? Nah, never replaced sex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that was the question. Uh, no, what's going wrong here? Huh? When you're doing... When you're so doing that was that... the purpose of the experiment, <laughs> huh? <laughs> when you're doing that sort of thing, right, it... You know, you're so intense in, in watching what's going on that you don't give any thought to the outcome. And uh, basically, when we got the airplane up above Mach 1, it was a, a feeling of achievement, sure, mm -hmm. but no big deal. So. Did it handle any differently? Oh, was yeah, there any sure. Sort of See, we ran into buffeting at about 88% of the speed of sound. Then we lost the ability to control the airplane at mm -hmm. about 9.3. And well, that's, that's fun. Where, Good heavens. That's where we took a hard look at, at the horizontal stabilizer <laughs> and then used it uh -huh. as a flying tail. Yeah. And we controlled it on through Mach 1. And then as the airplane went supersonic, and we got a supersonic back flow with the whole airplane, all the buffeting smoothed out, yeah. and we got our elevators back then. Um, any, uh, Tom Wolf in the book, uh, The Right Stuff, says that you and your voice have uh, been the pattern and the uh, speech uh, mannerisms for commercial and uh, military air pilots in the United States. Is that? Well, I, yeah, I came out of West Virginia, and I did have quite a draw for a long time. But I, <laughs> I learned to speak differently, obviously. You can tell. But do you believe... <laughs> But do you believe that commercial pilots today are talking like you talk? Well, I, just, I don't know. It's a matter of opinion. So. Uh -huh. it's, I've noticed it when people get on the uh, PA and start you talking. You mean they have an emergency every time you No, no, on? not an emergency, <laughs> but just, you know, pointing out things. And the, yeah, like, they, yeah, well, it's, it's calming. It is. Know? It's very soothing to know and that. And to their own selves, too. Um, uh, you've had, as a test pilot, you must have had some close calls. Are there any that come to mind at this point? Well, yeah, you get, sure, when you, you stick your neck out, you get bit every once in a while. I, I got shot down in World War II. I lost the tail off a of P-39 in training. And then, then in an NF-104, I ended up getting burned in a pressure suit when I ended up about 108,000 feet and got in a flat spin and ejected out. So. Now, you're so casual about describing that that I think that's probably not a bad idea, you know, the way you say that. But you, now you said 108,000 yeah, feet. Yeah, we, we had an, a rocket-boosted 104 that when I was running the astronaut school, we were training the guys. We were getting them above, well, giving them about 70 seconds of zero G in a full pressure suit with reaction control, sidearm control, attitude controllers mm -hmm. like was on the Mercury, Gemini, and capsule, and the shuttle. I'm gone again. I don't know what <laughs> that is. But, uh, <laughs> just attitude controllers in space. Yeah. And uh, we could give them that experience cheaply. 
And I was doing the test work on the airplane. I was commenting on the school and uh, ended up trying to establish where we would run into problems. And then we got bit in a hurry. Yeah. And, uh, and when I ejected in a flat spin, then the seat hit me in the damn face and I got on fire. Mm, 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 mm. It ruined your whole day. Now that wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a thrill to meet you, uh, General. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, Chuck yeah. Yeager, ladies and gentlemen. Hotel accommodations for most guests of Late Night with David Letterman furnished by Berkshire Place at Dunphy Classic Hotel in exchange for this announcement. For reservations at Dunphy Hotels in the U.S. and Europe, call toll-free 800-228-2121. Thank you very much. Hi there. We're just about finished. First of all, I want to thank the studio audience. You folks were wonderful as always. Also, my thanks to Brother Theodore.